Hello everyone, good morning to you and good evening from here in Southampton where I'm stuck with COVID and testing positive so I couldn't possibly get on the plane to join you today. I'm gutted, I can't be with you for this event or the awards banquet tomorrow. But I'm also pleased to be able to talk to you with some thoughts about uh, where we go with, from here with AI to maybe kickstart the discussions you know I know you're going to have um, in San Francisco today. So I'm going to do what we all do on Zoom and um, share my screen and hope this works. And I called the talk from AI to Eternity uh, because it had a nice ring about it. And of course, I based it on um, a uh, the film, uh, 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 which was um, you know, a very famous film, From Here to Eternity, a bit of a turning point in film history, quite a racy film, uh, told from the point of view of the rank and file. Um, and it, it was a bit of a turning point in history, it's a very a, a sort of a real life drama, as opposed to being a um, more romantic um, uh, uh, drama. And and uh, when I did, was doing the research for this, I really I had didn't know before, stupidly, but this was the phrase from here to eternity comes from Roger Kipling's poem, "Gentlemen Rankers," about soldiers in the British Army, who were he described as sheep become a sheep who'd gone astray and the gentlemen rankers were, were men who could have been officers but were actually were rank and file didn't become officers and were basically herded like sheep to their their fate or destiny and damned from here to eternity and i'm sort of thinking about where we are with ai today you know we have we're at a bit of a turning point of we can see where we might get to in terms of AI potentially controlling us. And how do we ensure that as we develop the technology that we are, we are working in partnership with AI, we're not going to just blindly go down a route where the machines end up controlling us. Um, and and that's, that's what I really want to discuss today. So I just take you, um, I haven't got much time, I'll just take you through a brief history of AI as I think it because the, the important point to make is that AI today is about machine learning, trade on lots of data, hasn't always been like that, of course. Um, we like to think, the Brits like to think we started with AI and, and, and it was a very philosophical argument he was putting forward about good machines think. Then we, we moved into a world of uh, decision trees, largely coming out of philosophy. There weren't computers to do the, the, the really build intelligent systems. And we've had traditionally waves of AI followed by funding, um, AI winters, funding blights. Um, we, we that, uh, you know, the work on decision trees carried on, of course, and led us to expert systems, knowledge-based systems. I began my career as a computer scientist in the 1980s. It was a huge program at that time, but it didn't deliver on the hype. These things are now mainstream, but at the time it was, they were considered not to have delivered. Um, and, and so we had another, uh, AI winter and uh, then uh, people, people like Jeff Hinton were beginning to think about neural nets which was considered science fiction at the time completely uh, you know um, impossible um, and uh, but then uh, there was there was like enough conviction to say let's have a funding program then we have another that didn't deliver on the hype we have another winter but of course the work continued and um, we're now into an, an era where all that work has led us to where we are now with machines, uh, software and machines that can, in um, constrained circumstances, um, beat human beings at games and in, you know, analyzing uh, large amounts of data, um, I wouldn't say in face recognition, but um, moving towards being able to, you know, pick people out in the crowd. Um, very easily. Uh, so many things that uh, in constrained circumstances can context machines can do better than human beings. Is there going to be a funding winter? Will machine learning hype? Um, uh, you know, is there too much hype about this? Well, uh, well, it's clearly in use and being developed. The question is how much research funding and where's the new breakthrough going to come that's going to lead us into what people talk about as advanced general, uh, sorry, artificial general intelligence. Um, the sci-fi uh, world of machines uh, being able to outthink human beings and potentially be in control. Uh, why have we got all this now? Well, it's, we, we can do what we can do with the machine learning, um, training on large sets of data. We've got the data and we've got the compute power. So that's, of course, um, 
uh, led us to the world of huge opportunity for AI in health and transport and education and energy, um, potentially saving the planet, you know, um, helping us achieve net zero and sustainability and maybe deliver on some of the real problems we have today in terms of the services we want to provide for our citizens in the world but can't afford to with human beings there aren't enough staff around to do things so you know the rhetoric was about how everyone was going to lose their job to ai i think the rhetoric today is well we can't find the staff so can we have the ai to do the work instead and let the human beings do what they're good at um wouldn't it be wonderful if we could make the the health, our health services are so much more efficient using AI and, and leave the, the patient care to the human beings. But, but it, these are hard systems to turn around. There is the potential, but there's the downside too. Sorry, I've missed out a slide there. Those slides have got muddled up. Um, this is, uh, so the, around um, early 2017, um, the I got a call from number 10 to, to ask me to co-chair a review of AI for the UK government with Jerome Pacenti, who was the chief exec of Benevolent AI at the time, to look at growing the artificial in, intelligence industry in the UK. So this was at the time when the rhetoric was about everyone losing their jobs to AI. How do we take the opportunities for AI to grow the economy and, and grow new jobs to, so that they could um, balance out the jobs that were gonna be lost? Little did we know what was around the corner in terms of pandemics and wars in Europe and, and energy shortages and all the things that, um, that we have dealt with since then. But uh, we published our review in 2017, a set of recommendations that were um, accepted by the government as part of their industrial strategy. And then it became, um, in uh, 2018, it became a sector deal, which is effectively a billion pound package um, from government and industry to invest in AI in the UK. And our key recommendations were in four areas. One was about data, how we manage data and the establishment of data trust to encourage data sharing. Industry told us that that was one of the key things we needed to, to, to manage. Uh, for innovation, to allow innovation. Skills, we, we came up with, we developed programs that were funded by the government in terms of um, uh, PhDs in AI, industry funded AI, MSc scholarships. Um, this was to train people to become machine learning programmers. Uh, fellowships to recruit and retain staff in the universities and a diversity campaign that I'll come back to. Leadership, we did, they, they set up an office for AI in the, in the government. Um, an AI council that I'm a member of and establishing the Turing Institute as the National Institute of AI and Data Science. So, you know, where do people look for advice? And uh, most importantly, of course, supporting the uptake and adoption of AI in both public and private sectors. Um, this is the, I only got time to talk about one thing we did, but this was the, 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 the uh, diversity game changer, I think, that uh, we realized that if we were going to fund a lot of AI PhDs, PhD students studying machine learning, programming and doing, you know, quite theoretical advances in that area. Um, and, you know, MSCs in AI training, turning computer scientists into machine learning programmers. And um, we were going to we were going to continue the, um, the, 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 lack, the lack of diversity in AI. We were just going to put take the same sort of people and make them into machine learning programmers and we wouldn't have any diversity. And so we came up with this idea of MSc conversion courses, which uh, the idea was that people came onto these courses who, who didn't have the traditional um, scientific background. So weren't computer scientists, weren't mathematicians um, particularly, but uh, could have been other scientists or humanities students or philosophy students or life sciences students, um, that, uh, you know, and the key thing for, was to get diversity in, in terms of discipline and also for um, to, to change the, the, the whole act, uh, bring more diversity into the student pipeline. We, uh, there were a thousand government funded scholarships and they had to be awarded to women, black students and disabled students of underrepresented groups. So, and there were um, at least 50% of the scholarships that went through this have been gone to underrepresented groups and it's been a real game changer in terms of um, diversity on this type of course and we've got money to do more of that um, and the announcement actually is in London Tech Week next week the Chancellor's already promised the funding so I'm excited about that. Um, now this is um, you know how are we going to think about socially responsible AI it's not 
their diversity is very important, but it's not the only thing. And is ethics the only way? The Brits in the audience, I really want to entitle this slide, the only way is ethics. Uh, you might get that joke. But um, uh, there's lots of ethics research groups developing, and um, but, but it's very hard. We come up with principles, but it's extremely hard. And we've got some really good ones, don't get me wrong. And the, this is just what's it, the, the group type of groups in the UK. There are many around uh, in other countries around the world. But it's very hard to, it's, you can talk about it from a pr principled point of view, but it's quite hard to put that into practice. Um, and, you know, so to help industry to actually uh, develop AI in a socially responsible way. Uh, frameworks, we need to develop frameworks to do this. Um, and who checks that industry is abiding by those frameworks? All this has got to be worked out. A number of countries have come up with a, a national strategies that include ethical principles. Um, we had the House, our House of Laws developed a report on these lines in 2018. The EU, of course, have been thinking about building on GDPR, been thinking about this. This is their report on accountability in AI systems in published in April 2019. And Beijing, uh, similarly, has a set of AI principles that was published in uh, May 2019. And um, there are many others. It's not an inclusive list. It's just to examples of, of what's been published. But how do you put that into practice? And as part of it, who who's the, who who polices this area, right? Who's who decides whether something is ethical or unethical? Um, so I, I, we're beginning to see AI regulation I, ideas come through as part of national strategies. The EU, of course, ahead of the game on its um its uh, AI Act um, again, building on GDPR and taking a risk based approach to um, the development of AI regulation. Um, Beijing's taking approach about looking at um, algorithms. Um, and the UK is gonna, gonna produce a report this year um, on its approach to AI regulation. The US, um, and when you think about the US and, and Europe are coming to an agreement maybe about um, regulation of AI, because if you're gonna trade AI products and services, you've got to um, agree what standards um, you build your products and your services to, and what agreement can you get across international borders. Um, there's um, been more talks between the EU and the US and, and um, you know, who knows how this is actually going to evolve, but it's a very one to watch in terms of global agreements on AI regulation. And, I want to just set that in a context that we, Kieran and I talk about in our book. I'm going to just whiz you through it and hope, encourage you to buy it to, to learn more. Um, we talk about our book for internets is uh, talk about data, uh, geopolitics and the governance of cyberspace. And in the, in, in the book, why for internets? Well, we talk about you know, the idea that the internet might split, um, you know, you might have, um, and this AI regulation could go the same way. The idea that you've got two AI superpowers, China and the US, and, and uh, all this could is forcing a split of the internet. We don't like calling it a splinter net because the internet is a network of networks. And so it's unlikely to splinter in any meaningful sense, but it could fragment in terms of walled gardens. And, it's, and we think it's more um, nuanced than just a US-Chinese um, binary split. And when you think about the internet, it was founded on uh, the principles of openness in terms of both engineering value and political value. And of course, when we all went onto the internet in COVID March, 2020, when the pandemic hit, the internet stayed up and running, which is a huge testament to the pioneers um, who, who established it in the first place on the, on the values of openness, right? Decentralization, efficient flow of data, open standards, freedom of speech. These were our values that uh, our Western values that were, you know, on which this was, it was sort of a, I think of them as a league of gentlemen. It was, you know, who would have thought anyone would want to do any harm with something like the internet? Tim Berners-Lee built the World Wide Web on top of that with the same, absolutely the same values and a set of standards around that. So we talk about the uh, one internet, the Silicon Valley open internet. Um, uh, this is the first internet, if you like. And the one that is the glue of everything, if this breaks, if, the, if, we, if we don't have the same technical standards, if we lose that around the world, if that gets broken, then the whole thing um, just, just evaporates into a set of walled gardens. And, 
and uh, we lose the power of a global internet. And what would save us then in a pandemic or anything like that in the future? That van, by the way, is the van that Vince Cerf and Bob Kahn went around the US in to persuade people to use their TCP IP uh, protocols and, and it's in the computer history museum and I think it's an amazing part of history but the key thing that we have to maintain and we have to get our governments to understand is that the interoperability is what makes it work but the you know the the uh the principle of innovation that the internet uses is move fast and break things, await harms, learn and revise. Can we do that with AI? Is this, you know, is this what, it, it, maybe we have to be more positive. And we see some of the problems with openness. It, we think our values, it, you know, but anonymity leads to incivility. Um, uh, uninterpreted data, no one, no one checking on the content leads to fake news. This is just what human beings do. Kieran, this is his phrase, the monoculture of white male nerds leads to diversity problems. Interoperability leads to psychosecurity issues and malware. And so many, you know, these are the, this is the yin and yang of openness, right? If you want it to be open, then you're going to have to work out how you deal with it when it, when, when it goes wrong because of human beings being what they are. And so we talk about in the book four ethical responses to that open internet. If we had longer, I'd, I'd get you to try and put your hands up and say what, what these pictures represent. Here they are. So we've got the open internet, four ethical responses around the world. The, the bus, Brussels bourgeois internet is um, privacy and human rights above everything else, GDPR, anticipate harms and neutralize, um, fantastic in its way, but, but does it allow for innovation? Um, so that's our second internet. Our third internet rolling around the world from west to east. Uh, the Beijing, you might want to call it surveillance, but we, we are more generous and call it the paternal internet. Um, Beijing from the get-go understood that the internet could be used both to disseminate information uh, and to allow people to exchange information, but also to control what people are saying and understanding what they're saying. And that's been the, the, the sort of underpinning of the way the internet's developed in China. On top of that, because of the government can look, you know, they have, because of what the government can do, what it can do. They've been pioneering technologies in autonomous vehicles and face recognition, which we're only too happy to adopt. But how do we set that into our, into our culture? And the outreach that China has in its Belt and Road Initiative is very powerful. So that's the third internet. And the fourth internet is the one that uh, you're sitting in this, uh, in this world, the DC commercial internet, we call it, where Silic Silic the Silicon Valley companies uh, lobby uh, the lawmakers in Washington to get the, the rules and regulations that help the companies grow. Nothing wrong with that, but you have to understand it's a different driver. It's a very different driver to the driver in Europe or in China. And huge innovation, but within war guns, actually. So something to think about as we think about how the internet might evolve. Then there's the, the spoiler model. We call it the Moscow spoiler model because it largely comes from Russia, but there are other countries too, who um, we don't give them the, the credit of being a fifth internet because they're largely parasitical, but they'd do anything to, to bring anyone at some anyone else's um, change, use the internet to achieve their aims, to attack other countries, um, to troll and produce fake news and computational propaganda and the bots that, that um, uh, we see uh, we have to deal with um, in terms of having our open internet. And, you know, the Russians, of course, have said they're going to develop their own internet, the RUNET, but, uh, which they claim to have tested successfully in 2019. But um, we said in the book, if they did that, then it would cut them off from global systems like SWIFT, which is something that's been on our minds a lot in the last few months. And of course, um, all countries use the internet for intelligence gathering. And uh, you know, why is a country that's so into that going to stop itself looking at the rest of the world's intelligence? So, or looking, getting intelligence from the rest of the world. So, so we, we call that um, a spoiler model. So it's a it's an ethical response to the open internet <laughs> that we have to deal with, but we don't give it the credit of being a fifth internet. So we have four internets um, and there could be others, you know, easy exercise for the reader. Think of others that have developed or might develop. 
And one last point about this, and this is very relevant to the point about how AI is going to evolve um, and who controls the technology, is that, um, you know, in 2019, 50% of the world was on the internet. Now in post-COVID, it's 60% of the world. Where will it grow? It will grow in rural China, rural Africa, and uh, most, a lot of Africa and rural India. And of course, we know that the way China will approach the internet, China is largely influencing, is influencing a lot of countries in Africa uh, in terms of how they uh, use the internet. Um, and, and India is, um, is a huge country in terms of numbers. Uh, and which way will it go with, with its internet? And, you know, we could end up with a world, if we were at 100% today of everybody on the internet, then look at the numbers there. If, if we, we now, uh, you know, if India goes more towards the paternalistic surveillance um, internet and the Middle East does, then they would completely out-dominate in numbers, um, America and Europe. Um, so we could be a very small part of what's what's evolving here. And in fact, in the book, we call India the swing state. There's a lot of people, um, they're using the internet very successfully. There's a They have a digital ID that's been used very successfully um, to get people bank accounts and on the internet. And, and um, but what if the government start to use that to control and uh, reduce privacy? And there's a there's a battle going on in India. And so we, we call them. It's very important the way India goes. And it's the same impact. These values that we talk about in the book will be the same values under which AI regulation will develop. And, and, and we talk about this in the book as well. So where does the responsibility lie for socially responsible AI? I am um, coming towards the end of the talk now, and I, I couldn't leave it before um, talking about Stephen Hawking, uh, a hugely respected scientist, of course, who died in 2018. And he did an interview. Well, he lived a lot longer than anyone thought he would, but he did an interview in 2014 with the BBC, and they asked, they talked about artificial intelligence. And this, remember, 2014 is uh, eight years ago, so just at the beginning of when machine learning was 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 coming to the fore uh, was the new hype and um he uh talked about the fact that if well he took not the fact he talked about the idea that his thoughts were that if we develop ai to its full potential what we might call agi artificial general intelligence it could spell the end of the human race because we are actually quite slow to evolve because we're biological um, and machines can evolve very fast. And if you've got, if you've got, if the machines um, are designing the machines um, uh, and, you know, then th they can quite quickly outperform the human race and we could become slaves to the machines. And this of course was what was explored in the, the film, the matrix and other science fiction movies. And um, we, where are we now? With AI, how are we gonna how are we gonna think about the future? Um, is that is the Stephen Hawking scenario the one that is it, we are inevitably doomed with, or can the companies that are doing this this development um, uh, help us make it the future we want? You wouldn't know it, but unless you know it. But this is the uh, website uh, front page, of the website for DeepMind. I love the fact that you are supposed to, you know, you have to know that. Um, there's their logo. Um, and uh, AI, they're, they're saying, you know, AI could be one of humanity's most useful inventions, of course. That's, we know that. Um, and they describe themselves as a team of scientists, engineers, ethicists, and more committed to solving intelligence to advance science and benefit humanity. Yeah, wouldn't that isn't that wonderful? And but how do we know that's what they're doing? We're always, how do we how do we understand? How do we get under the bonnet with deep mind? I mean, I I don't disbelieve them, uh, but how, uh, who do they report to about that? And does that you know does that matter? Um, uh, another example of something huge is GPT three. It's come from OpenAI. Similar principles, um, producing a potentially very scary. Um, tool that um, can fool all sorts of people into thinking this is real, but what they're reading. Um, you know, where do we go with this? Where is this going to go? And how do we get involved in that? And how, how, what, what is it that our governments have got to regulate um, in order to make sure it's used well? 
um, can't, you can't put the genie back in the bottle. And now we have uh, Wu Dao 2.0 from China, which uh, allegedly knocks GPT-3 off of its perch. Um, the values in China will be very different to ours. And, you know, do we buy? Are we going to buy Wu Dao 2 and allow people to use it without any thought about what that means? I don't think we should. And, and it's where we have those discussions. And so what I'm really trying to say to you today is, we we are some of the most knowledgeable and influential people in this world us the computer science community we have to play a role in this in terms of helping governments helping companies think about the type of future we're trying to build and how we make sure that we aren't just going to be sheep being led into some awful controlled world that we have we have no power over and this is the, the sci-fi, you know, we, we have um, the uh, Mark Zuckerberg looking like Mark Zuckerberg trying um, his different outfits on in the metaverse. Personally, I'm very, um, I think Web3 is it's, it's a buzz and a hype at the moment, but it's terribly important that we're, as we, um, I mean, Tim Berners-Lee is trying to do it with Solid and there's many people thinking about Web3 as a way to, De re decentralize the web and the internet? Is it time for a new internet? But I do think it's time for us to think through, um, you know, how things have evolved in the world of the internet and how we can use those, the good and the bad of what's happened to help us in, to inform what happens with AI. That the, um, the, the, the black and green picture there is a, a shot from the matrix where in fact, in the matrix, we human beings, it turns out are just bioenergy for the machines. Um, you know, is that inevitable? That's the Stephen Hawking sort of argument. And then you have these hugely mixed things, these images here just taken off the, off the web. Uh, you know, who, <laughs> what's the machine and what's the human being in all this, all right? Um, uh, I think that's an inc incredibly important to debate to have. And maybe human-centered AI is a big part of the solution. Uh, uh, Stanford University has its great center on human-centered artificial intelligence. Ben Schneiderman, the famous user interface um, man, one of our community, this new book out on human-centered AI. At Southampton, we've got a new center on human-centered AI uh, where we're using it to we're training a cohort of PhD students in this area from our socio-technical sort of uh, background. And, and um, you know, this is going to be a very important part, but is it, is it, is it, I, th I think it's got to be more than this. Um, this is this is a big part of it. Keep the human in the loop, but how do we do that practically? Um, it isn't just about user interface design. It, it isn't just about um, uh, training people to understand the world from a socio technical point of view. We've got to. We we really really, and this is what I put on the on the last slide. We really need other disciplines to help us think our way through this. You know, I, I, my favorite phrase at the moment is, and this is my last slide, I just want to, my favorite phrase at the moment is leading from the future. We've got to learn to lead from the future. Think about what, where we want to be as a society with harnessing the power of AI in such a way that it's good for us, um, good for humanity, good for the future of the planet, good for our children's children's children. Um, uh, and maybe we should be thinking about working back from eternity to AI, right? That's how we need to think about it. My mentor, Karen Spark Jones, had a wonderful phrase saying computing is too important to be left to men. And that wasn't to denigrate men. It was to say this is too important. This technology is too important. We need a diversity of people involved in developing it for the good of the world. And I would say along those lines, AI is too important to too important to be left to computer scientists. We really need diversity of thought. My other mantra is if it's not diverse, it's not ethical. And those two things are very tied together and hopefully tied together some of the thoughts that I've given you as part of this talk. We need the lawyers, the ethicists, the sociologists, the psychologists, the political scientists, the economists, the business schools, the historians, the creative arts to help us find our way. We have to embrace those. And I would really urge the ACM to think about how we can build that, that interdisciplinary community so we can be one of the, the leading lights in terms of helping the world find its way forward from, um, in a, you know, its way forward from AI where we are now 
to where we might be in the future. I have to finish there. Um, I've run out of time. I'm very sorry, again, not to be with you. Have a wonderful, wonderful day. I will listen in uh, and look forward to the discussions. And I'll be toasting tomorrow um, at the banquet. Or I might be sound asleep, actually, but in principle, a toast for the banquet tomorrow. Hope to see you all soon somewhere in the world. Bye.